welcome, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues. If you could take your seats. Thank you very much. I'm Fiona Godley, Editor-in-Chief of the BMJ. It's an enormous pleasure to be here, um, both personally, professionally, and as a partner on this very exciting program, first uh, preventing overdiagnosis meeting, we hope, of many. Um, particularly grateful to all those who've put such a lot of work into um, this great program. Um, what's wonderful about this meeting? It, we're amongst friends. It has this terrific sense of um, people coming together who've struggled or been interested in this area and are now looking across disciplines, sharing their experiences. What's the risk of this meeting is that we're amongst friends and um, there are issues here that we need to be very careful to keep aware of. We need to think about um, the coexistence of underdiagnosis. We need to think about the risk of overemphasizing, overestimating overdiagnosis. We need to know there's a lot of challenge in the room. People need to be free to challenge each other on the data. And I think that's something I would like to see. Um, we're about preventing harm. Um, and we need to have really good evidence um, to make sure that that's, that's what's happened. Um, but I just want to go back to why this is great, the fact that we're all here, we've given the time to think about this very important problem, um, clear evidence of overdiagnosis in many fields with all of its contingent harms. And um, I look forward very much to this next session on what we can do about overdiagnosis. It's an enormous pleasure to introduce uh, Virginia Moyer, who's chair of the US Preventive Services Task Force, also vice president of um, maintenance certification and quality at the American Board of Pediatrics. Uh, she's a pediatrician. She um, has expertise in ambulatory care, diagnostic testing, evidence-based medicine, and she's also served as a deputy editor on pediatrics and is founding editor of Evidence-Based Child Health. So she's an enormously experienced commentator and practitioner, and I really look forward to hearing what she has to say. Thank you, Virginia. I'm assuming my slides will come up momentarily. Here we go. Um, so I'm going to talk about the U.S. Brunette Services Task Force uh, perspective on, on overdiagnosis, and I'm really largely going to spend my time telling you about the task force and how it functions, because I think that will help everyone understand how we incorporate the issue of overdiagnosis into our, our recommendations. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Watch the back of the head there. So, <clears throat> so uh, this is in uh, USA Today, um, now a couple of years ago, and there's a recommendation by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force being made public on Friday will not be a surprise to cancer specialists when we recommended not doing PSA testing, and this is what the public thought. Who are these people, and what were they thinking? So who is the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force? Well, we are 16 experts in primary care prevention and research methods. We are appointed for four-year terms. Occasionally, we get uh, sentenced to an extra year or two. Um, we are congressionally mandated and government supported, but we are independent. And there's actually language in the ACA that says that we're supposed to be independent. We are wondering sometimes who's reading that. We're supported by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality um, but the agency does not tell us what to do. It merely supports what we do. We are uh, family practitioners, internists, pediatricians, OB-GYN, nursing, and behavioral health. Uh, we receive significant support from the evidence-based practice centers, which uh, produce the evidence reports on which we base our recommendations. And we have a large number of non-member liaisons, partners, who are from other primary care associations, from federal agencies and from other organizations that have a strong interest in prevention. What do we do? What we do and what we've done since 1984 when the task force was founded is we make recommendations that are intended to improve clinical practice and promote the health of the American public. That is our responsibility. Our recommendations are on preventive services for asymptomatic people, meaning people without signs or symptoms of the condition that is targeted by the preventive service. There are three types of preventive services that we look at. Screening tests, such as screening for obesity, screening for prostate cancer or screening for lipids. Preventive medications, such as aspirin for preventing stroke or heart disease or folate to prevent neural tube defects. 
and we make recommendations about counseling, about healthy behaviors such as quitting smoking, eating a healthy diet, or staying active. So that's the broad swath of what we do. I'm going to talk about the process. I didn't show you a, uh, an extremely busy diagram that we made up and that we're about to abandon because it's way too busy that shows our entire process on one slide. But this is how the process goes. How do we pick our topics and how do, you, how do we prioritize them? So anyone, anyone can nominate a topic. You just go onto our website, you go onto the, the, the link that says nominate a topic and you nominate the topic. Those nominated topics are then prioritized by the task force. We have about 70 active topics. Um, we have three meetings a year. At each meeting we can discuss an absolute maximum of seven topics and that's insane to try to do seven topics in a meeting. Five is somewhat more reasonable so you can do the math and figure out that it's really hard for us to keep up with very many more than the number of topics we have now which means if we take on new topics we have to either let an old topic lag or actually drop an old topic. Then decide whether something is within scope. Is it an asymptomatic population? Is it something that's doable or referable from the primary care setting? Does it represent a substantial health burden? And that would be both in the, in the public health sense or in the individual sense. And is there potential for a task force recommendation to affect clinical practice? So there are times when we've chosen not to take on a topic because what we say isn't going to change anything. Either whatever it is is already being done, something that, that seems like a great idea, it's already being done, and it's, we're not likely to change things, or um, on a few occasions, we've really felt like we're not in a position to affect practice in an area. So really largely based on whether there's existing controversy or on a belief that a gap exists between evidence and practice. The steps in the process include developing a research plan, which involves defining the questions and the outcomes that we're most interested in, doing a systematic evidence review, and if you go all the way back to the first task force, uh, they actually did their own evidence reviews, which is pretty painful since, I, as I said in the beginning, and, and we may not have adequately emphasized, we are all volunteers, we all have day jobs, and so uh, we need somebody who can, as their day job, can uh, do a systematic evidence review. Um, evaluating both the quality of the in individual studies and the strength of the available evidence across all the available studies. And then uh, we make a recommendation by determining the balance of benefits and harms and linking our recommendation to a judgment about the net benefit, which I'll talk a little more about. So this is just a picture of what a research plan looks like. We used to call this an analytic framework and we still do a lot of the time. Uh, this one, I, I sort of, I keep this in my slide set because it's pediatric. And I, at some point in my life, I get tired of talking about adult medicine topics. I'm a pediatrician. So I keep this one in the slide set. This is, a, this is the analytic framework for screening for hip dysplasia in babies. And so you can see each one of these little numbers represents a key question. A key question is something that will receive a systematic evidence review, not a sort of contextual evidence review brief discussion, but this, there will be a systematic evidence review for each one of these items that has a number. And so that's, so here you can just briefly look and see what you might find, um, and I can tell you that there's not a lot out there on this particular topic. So then the evidence review gets done. It gets done by an evidence-based practice center. This is a commissioned uh, project. We work, the members of the task force who are on the the lead group, the lead group is the subcommittee that is focused on a particular topic. And so we have leads and we have lead leads. The lead lead is the person who has to stand up at the meeting and talk about it. The lead lead is frequently picked the week before the meeting um, when you discover that somebody has to stand up and talk about it at the meeting. So, the, but the, the committee, the, the group of leads works very closely with the Evidence-Based Practice Center uh, to um, review the evidence. We, use, we make inclusion and exclusion criteria based on the key questions. We make decisions about what databases we're going to search. We obtain references from key articles. Um, and we, do, we also consult experts, not just among the task force, but um, although we do not include subspecialists on the task force, there are always specialists involved in the evidence review. So it is, the, for example, for the um, review on prostate cancer, we had specialists involved in the evidence review. 
So then we assess the evidence across the whole analytic framework. So if you go back to that framework, ideally what we have is key question one always is, is there direct evidence that screening for this particular, if it's a screening question, screening for developmental dysplasia of the hip results in improved functional outcomes. So we're looking for studies that actually address that directly. The reason we have a framework is that question, the, the key question number one is very rarely, although not, it, it happens, but it's not often answered uh, with um, multiple individual studies. And so then we look for studies at each point in this analytic framework, and you can see why the framework is so important. If we leave something out of the framework, then we're not going to get the right answer. It's a logic model. So we assess the evidence across the entire analytic framework, synthesizing the assessment of the evidence for each key question. We determine both the magnitude, we judge the magnitude of both the benefits and the harms. We use the language of substantial, moderate, small, and zero. We determine and judge the balance of benefits and harms to get the magnitude of net benefit. And then we also judge the certainty of net benefit. And if there isn't sufficient evidence, then we don't have any choice at all about what our recommendation statement is going to be. If the evidence is insufficient at any point, then it's an I statement. An I statement is not a recommendation, it's a statement. And it means there's insufficient evidence and we are not making a recommendation. We differ considerably from uh, panels, particularly panels from professional organizations that make recommendations. A professional organization has a responsibility to its membership to come up with an answer. The membership needs something to work from. We do not do that. If there isn't evidence, we don't make a recommendation, which means we frustrate our audience many times, but it also means we adhere to the evidence. If the evidence is sufficient, we assign a letter grade, A, B, C, or D, that reflects both the certainty and magnitude of the net benefit. And I just want to throw in that this is frequently a matter of judgment. Um, that it is often deciding whether something is moderate or small or moderate or large or whether certainty is moderate or low. Where do those, where do those lines come? So there's lots and lots and lots of discussion. So this is, the, um, this is the key equation that we use. We look at the magnitude of the benefits. We look at the magnitude of the harms. We subtract the harms from the benefit from the known benefits, we get the net benefit. If that number is zero or negative, zero or negative, then that is a recommendation, a D recommendation. If that number is positive, then we have to make a decision about how high our certainty is and, and how great the benefit is to determine the letter grade. So we pay great attention to harms, um, at, perhaps because we perceive that often others don't. Um, but we have a problem in that evidence regarding harms is often scant and is often of low quality. And we have it, we do, and I think I can publicly admit this, that we are willing to consider theoretical harms and we are frequently willing to take evidence of slightly lower quality when we're talking about harms because we have so much concern that the harms have not been adequately measured and that they must receive adequate attention. We use something called the conceptual confidence interval, which um, I'm almost certain Russ Harris made that up, and I think it's an absolutely wonderful uh, way of thinking. So not necessarily a numerical confidence interval, but a conceptual confidence interval around, uh, around our, our plan. Looking at the balance of benefits and harms, um, you know, the potential harms are real, but they may be very hard to quantify. And they include all the things that, that we've talked about here, false positives, false negatives, most and overdiagnosis, obviously, which is what we're talking about here. Um, we, it's often very difficult to know the magnitude and the duration of harm. It's often subjective. And it's also very often in a different metric from the metric that is used to measure the benefits. It's all very easy when you have death. But beyond that, it's extraordinarily difficult to balance be benefits against harms. We try to use patient important outcomes, uh, not laboratory tests. Uh, we, don't, we don't have explicit criteria for the magnitude of benefits and harms, so those are implicit criteria, which is why we have a lot of discussion. Um, and when we talk about substantial benefit, we're talking about 
an impact on a high burden of illness or a major effect on an uncommon outcome, which makes it awfully hard to find a common metric. The boundaries, as I said before, between moderate and small, between moderate and low, um, it, those are very, very hard boundaries to assess, and, they, and judgment is involved. And is net benefit or certainty assessed differently depending on the stakes? And I think that's a, I, I think the answer to that is an obvious yes, even if you don't mean to do that when the stakes are extraordinarily high, either the stakes in terms of human life or the stakes in terms of, of cost, which we do not explicitly consider in a formal way, um, or uh, political cost probably does affect uh, our thinking. We keep this uh, actually posted all over the room. You would think that a whole bunch of people with doctoral degrees could remember this, but um, we actually, in the, in the room, when, when we're sitting in the room, there are the 16 of us around the table with the senior scientific officers sitting with us, um, and then the rest of the room is filled with our partners. So although our meetings are closed to the public, they are certainly open to our partners, and we welcome um, input from, from the partners who are in the room. And this uh, particular, th there's a poster sitting on a, a placard in several different places in the room so that we won't forget. These are the rules. No matter how badly we might want to give an A recommendation to something, we cannot give an A recommendation unless in our careful process we have found that the magnitude of net benefit we agree is substantial and the certainty is high. Otherwise, it can't get an A. It actually, no matter how badly you might want to recommend it, if the magnitude of net benefit is small, then the C is the best you're going to get. And of course, the political pressure to give it something higher than a C is almost overwhelming because now with the ACA, anything, the A and B recommendations get first dollar coverage, C recommendations don't. And then if it's zero or negative, it gets a D. And as I said before, if the certainty is low, it always gets an I. It doesn't matter how badly we would like to be able to make a statement. And that how badly actually applies to both Ds and Bs. It applies to positive and negative recommendations. There are many times when we'd like to say, don't do this. But we don't have adequate evidence to be able to make a strong statement. So certainty and magnitude. We try very hard to do those first. We don't decide to grade and then go back and see how we got there. We try very hard to do the certainty and the magnitude first. I don't know how many of you have ever given an APGAR score in the delivery room, but the way you give an APGAR score is you look at the baby, give it a score, and then the nurse says, so what are you taking points off for? And you have to make something up. We try really hard. We try really hard not to do that. Our goal is to do this in a, in a forward fashion starting with the certainty of net benefit and the magnitude of net benefit, and that takes us to the appropriate grade. So this is here just so you can see it. This is on our website. This gives you the language around the A, B, C, D, and I. And then the last steps after we voted a recommendation, we actually don't vote a recommendation at the meeting. We vote a draft recommendation at the meeting. That's posted for public comment. At least one, at least one task force member reads every single comment that comes in. For prostate cancer screening, that meant that uh, there were 3,000 comments, and the reader of those comments is in this room. <laughs> the comments are collated and addressed. They're actually collated by someone who contracts to do that for us so that every member doesn't have to do that individually. And then we vote on the final recommendation, having um, adapted the recommendation based on the public comments, and the recommendation is pub published. So that's the process. We've worked very hard on transparency with opportunities, opportunities for public comment, um, and uh, each of those places are places that someone could say something about overdiagnosis. So when do we consider overdiagnosis? You're going to recognize the following slides. We do it at every step in the process. We have some ground rules. You can't make someone who feels well feel better, but you can make them feel worse. So there's always a risk of near-term harm against the possibility of long-term benefit. Most individuals don't benefit from preventive services, population benefits. Most individuals don't. All the kids who get shots, very few of them, actually have a disease pre prevented. And all medical care include, can cause harm. We should have good evidence to link the right to the left side, um, and we really scrutinize harms. So topic selection. 
the, there's a potential for the task force recommendation to affect clinical practice. That's one of the places we think about overdiagnosis. Another place we think about overdiagnosis is in the adverse effects, the key questions. We always look for overdiagnosis in those key questions in the adverse effects of both the screening and the treatment. Um, we seek out evidence on overdiagnosis, often explicitly, depending on the topic. We may actually include that as an explicit question. And then uh, we judge the certainty of net benefit as low, moderate, or high, and the challenge of assessing the likelihood of overdiagnosis, that was meant to say overdiagnosis, is included there. And then overdiagnosis as a harm is considered in our balance of benefits and harms. So in each one of these places, the task force considers, um, considers overdiagnosis. And I think that takes me to the questions.